All right, I'm excited to have us around the virtual table all down in on Zoom to do a podcast. And we have some big news at the end of the podcast. Uh, th that'll be the biggest story of the day. Actually, we'll, we'll just start it now. We'll, we'll talk about it later. It's Catherine's last day. That's why we're doing this Boo. by video. We want, to get, we want to get all the emotions on, on video. Uh, and we'll talk about that, Catherine. The post went out, so people already know this. Yes. Um, but let's get to the news first. Uh, Chris, you wrote about impossible possibly going direct to consumer. They teased it with the tweets and emoji tweets. Uh, are, am I going to be able to get impossible burgers sent to my house now? Here's what, it, here's what I think. I think, yes, you're going to have a good set. Cause up here in the Seattle area, like it's, it hasn't hit retail yet. They did. Uh, they've been sort of inching towards this direct to consumer for a while, right? Like they rolled out in grocery stores in California and the East coast last year. And then uh, they announced more stores earlier this year. They got $500 million in funding and then they announced Kroger store. So they're in like 3000 locations right now. Uh, but yes, they tweeted out yesterday, a bunch of emojis, which was a burger next to a box next to an arrow with the word soon and a front door. So we took that to mean like, Hey, it looks like they're going direct to consumer. Uh, you'll be able to order impossible meat, which again, I'm excited for because it's not up here in Seattle. Uh, and they didn't ask me to take it down. So I'm going to assume they haven't asked for a correction or anything like that. So I'm going to assume that that is uh, what's going to happen here. Was there an indication it'd be national or just regional still? You know, I, there isn't. But, okay. you know, it, uh, we don't have any details as to what the availability will be, when, where, shipping to where. But I would imagine if you're going to put it in place, if you're going to be shipping them, then you're going to probably make it at least the lower 48 would be my guess. Right. Because they already have so, well, what are they in, you know, two, over 2,000 Kroger stores now. Uh, so many retail, they're getting to be in a lot of these retail locations. So mm -hmm. it seems like this is the way to sort of fill in the gaps and get to all those regions that they can already be in because all their restaurant sales have basically plummeted. So it makes sense that they're covering, yeah, at least at least the lower 48. They did first the thing where you could purchase it directly through restaurant partners, but then I'm assuming a lot of the restaurant partners just ran out of their impossible product slash maybe closed slash maybe people didn't want, want to buy like a huge brick at a time. So I would have. <laughs> yeah. Who wouldn't? Not everybody. Yeah. And that seemed like it was more of a solid to restaurants, right? Like, mm -hmm. Hey, you may have this, you can't, you can't really sell burgers right now. So if you want to go ahead and sell, you know, they had to do some FDA approval for it, but uh, yeah, I'm excited to see. And if, you know, I get proteins delivered through like crowd cow right now. And so I'm assuming it's probably going to be a, you know, similar. It's packed in dry ice. It arrives frozen, you know, not exactly the most environmentally friendly way to do things, but uh, you know, if I can order a bunch of bricks of impossible meat and just have it in the freezer for a long time. Uh, I wouldn't leave it I mean, past Pat Brown to maybe be a little more environmentally conscious than we've seen with like some of the others. True. I bet I'm wondering to see, I'm curious Good to see point. what the packaging looks like. I did brew, I did cook up, we had the barbecue fired up. I cooked up a uh, Beyond Burger yesterday and it made me think about, and again, not nothing with Beyond. I just like Impossible so much more. So um, that's Ooh. my personal preference. So I hope, can't wait to have the Impossible shipped to my home and try those on the barbecue. Yeah, yeah. So stay tuned. Grilling season is upon us. So yeah, you can diversify, get your impossible, and then you can have your beyond sausage and- And you know what else you can have? Uh, and you already had, Catherine. So the next story, we're gonna move on to this because it's another plant-based food. How are the nuggets? How are the rebellious nuggets? I thought they were great. So rebellious is a Seattle-based company. They are doing, uh, their whole point is that they want to reinvent the way that we process plant-based meat to make it more efficient and scalable. It started by an ex-Boeing engineer. Uh, but their first product is these little chicken nuggets and they're meant to be like not high and high class, but sort of just the stuff that you got in like a cafeteria as a kid, because initially they were targeting office cafeterias, school cafeterias, hospital cafeterias, like really big wholesale accounts. Obviously right now, a lot of those are closed. So they did a really quick pivot to retail. Um, I got to speak with the CEO and founder, Christy Lagali a couple of weeks ago. And she said that they'd had this planned for quite a while, but obviously COVID shutting down the majority of their business, they had to rethink things really quickly. So they sell packages of 30 frozen nuggets for I think $6. They're only at two locations in Seattle right now, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do ramp up and start doing shipping um, or 
just getting to more partners quickly because their whole thing is scalable plant-based meat. But, but onto the taste. I thought they were great. So I've had these nuggets before at events. I didn't really think I'd be able to emulate them at home because they've always been like, you know, those little fast food nuggets, they're like deep fried. How do you really copy that? But you just cook them in an oven, 450 degrees, I think, like four minutes each side. They got really crispy and delicious and juicy on the inside. And they totally reminded me of like a elementary school chicken nugget in a really good way. I had like nostalgia mm. flashbacks and um, didn't even have any dipping sauce with them. And I was still pretty on board. And the coolest thing is they're, I can at least convince myself they're like sort of a healthy food because <laughs> a serving is six nuggets and it's like 160 calories and uh, like a good amount of protein, the same amount of protein as chicken and like very low fat and saturated fat. So I can have it as like a snack or along with my lunch and they're pretty filling and I'm like. So McDonald's nuggets are spongy. Like, yeah. like, so I always go back and forth. Do they want to emulate the kind of the gross texture of like McDonald's ones or do they want to make them more actual chickeny? Um, and I've had, I tried them as well at Smart Kitchen Summit. It's been a while. It's interesting yeah. here how you, you're able to cook them at home. You don't have an air fryer. I'd be curious how they would come out in an air fryer. Oh, I bet they'd be good. Yeah, yeah. the methods they say is you can like pan fry, um, bake, and deep fry. I'm not going to deep fry because I'm lazy. I did try pan frying them and I I'll say they weren't as good as when they were baked. I think that just got the outside a little crispier. But the inside is totally, it's not quite as spongy as McDonald's, but it's not like a sort of, what do they call it? A chicken strip where you can kind of pull it apart. It's very much like processed nugget-y in a way where you're like, yeah. This it's it's processed <laughs> and spongy in a good way is what you're in saying. In a good way. Yeah, because you're like- Terrible for you in a good way. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think down the road, they're going to start developing some of the like nicer strips and bigger patties and things like that. But they're going to go high end nugget. Was yeah. what you're saying. And All it's right. pretty affordable. You get 30 for six bucks. I mean, that's like five yeah. servings. And yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Not too I mean, considering bad. like raised and rooted was like 12 bucks. I can't remember, but it was like super expensive for not many nuggets. Oh yeah, that was that's yeah. the blended one. It's chicken and I think so. Yeah, I remember getting it at the grocery store and just be like, whoa, these are not cheap. Yeah, so these are pretty affordable and I like that they're in the freezer so you can just like put as many as you want, heat them up, convenient, especially now when I, you know, if I don't have any food, I don't want to go to the grocery store. I just turn to my freezer and see what's hanging out in there. I wonder if it's because it's by virtue of the fact it's a nugget, which is pretty, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously usually a kid's food. It's usually like a cheaper food to go high mm -hmm. end. I mean, you paid a pretty rich premium with a possible burger. It may be pretty hard to convince parents to pay a rich premium for a nugget. So they, she had to come out of the gate. They had to come out of the gate at a lower price point. Yeah. And that's always been their goal. That's why they're selling to places like elementary school cafeterias and corporate cafeterias where they want to be lower costs, like the same price as these sort of mass produced nuggets or lower right away. And so I think they've achieved that with retail. It's only in two locations in Seattle right now, but hopefully they'll start expanding pretty soon. I know they have a new processing facility out in West Seattle, I think. So one day I, I wonder, like, oh, go ahead, Jen. No, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm please. sure your point was better than mine. <laughs> no, I was only going to say that the, um, you know, the schools are interesting because even though they're shut down, they're still serving meals. Mm -hmm. So like the schools here where I live still have to go meals. You can drive up and get them, you know, and it's meant for lower income families. You know, if you don't have access to those free lunches, then, you, you know, um, so that's interesting, you know, just that that market is probably still alive. Um, but adding this, like, I'm excited to try it. Like I'm excited to try impossible. We're very well, open minded here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I was going to go back to something you said, Catherine, about you didn't feel the need to use any sort of dipping sauce or anything, which for, you know, an alternative protein product, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that might be a really good test of just, I don't know, what do you think of how close, uh, how close they're getting it to not just a slightly healthier, better for the planet alternative, but also what we go back to again and again, which is, does it taste good? You mm -hmm. know, do I have to slather it with ranch dressing to stomach it? Or, you know, can it, can it be eaten by itself? So I think that's interesting you called that out. Yeah. 
And don't get me wrong, it would be good slathered in ranch dressing because what wouldn't? But because what wouldn't? What wouldn't? But I think the fact that they aren't trying to go for the high end immediately, like Impossible, which is like, oh yes, we're made from plants and it's amazing and it's bleeding and like we're starting out at a fancy restaurant in New York. They're like, we are starting out in these sort of mass produced cafeteria situations and they don't even really advertise that it's plant-based all the time. Mm -hmm. Their whole point is that like, you shouldn't have to know, the people making it shouldn't have to know, they don't have to do any sort of extra special preparation for it. It should just taste good and be affordable and be nutritious and then people will start eating it just naturally. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's definitely their goal. It's smart. I yeah. mean, you mm -hmm. put fried, you fried batter around anything. <laughs> exactly. It, tastes, it might taste okay. <laughs> it's a fail safe business model. Just fry it. Just put fried batter around anything and it tastes good. This next story, what's the deal, Jen, with all these home hydroponic systems? It seems like every week we're seeing a new one launch or seeing some new funding. And this latest news is Rice Gardens raised $2.6 million in fresh funding. Is this just all due to the pandemic and people just want to garden at home? Um, partially, yeah. I mean, we were already seeing, uh, I mean, you know, you all saw this at CES this year and there was a lot of news back in January of just companies coming to market with, uh, you know, indoor vertical farming systems that were specifically designed for your average consumer's kitchen. Then the pandemic happened, and Mike, I know you've written about this before too, but uh, it's it's seemingly really upped the demand for these systems. Um, the uh, Rise Gardens founders said that they saw like a 750% increase in sales since the pandemic or something, which is enormous. Um, and so Rise makes, um, they do kind of a cool thing, which is they, they have an at-home hydroponic system. You can grow leafy greens, you can grow herbs. Uh, it's automated like a lot of the other ones, which means it's really kind of taking the guesswork out of the farming process. You control it with an app, you know, when you water it, when you up the nutrients, et cetera, et cetera. But theirs is one, it's really good looking. Like I would keep it, it looks mm -hmm. like a piece of furniture from like West Elm or something. Um, so it like would fit into just your overall design scheme of your home. And also theirs is modular. So you can, it's sort of like a bookshelf configuration. So you can start with one shelf and add others as, you know, if you're, uh, if you want to produce more green. So depending on the size of your household, um, so I think those are pretty interesting aspects of their system. But yeah, I mean, I think by and large, we're just seeing a lot of demand for people wanting to grow their own stuff at home. Uh, obviously, having it indoors, if you can fit it, is a big plus because you can do it year round. You don't need... Uh, you don't need to worry about weather. And also I was just thinking about this the other day because, you know, here in Tennessee, our soil is clay. You can't grow anything in it without like really treating the soil, which is a complete pain. So it's like, it's an alternative for just, you know, a lot of environments we live in are not great for growing stuff outside without a lot of work and a lot of money. And, you know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, that we're definitely going to see more of this. I think what's, when I talked to one of the guys at Rise a few months ago, he basically said, you know how back decades ago, kitchens didn't come automatically with dishwashers. Well, think of indoor farming system as something similar, where eventually down the line kitchens, and we've heard this before from other folks, are just going to start to have these, uh, farms or gardens designed right into the kitchen infrastructure. I don't know if I agree with that. I could see them maybe being in the house somewhere. I mean, this thing could go in a closet, right? It's, it's going to have LED lighting. I think the most expensive house room in the house is the kitchen. But I do agree, like the long-term macro trend is you're going to see more of these. But yeah, I mean, I've heard the same data from Aero Garden. Uh, they had huge demand spikes. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've heard that from others. Um, we've, we've seen, obviously, uh, a lot of a lot of the run on seeds and, and just general gardening equipment. This one actually does seem to be focused on higher volume. Part yeah. of the problems with a lot of the other ones are they're just for growing small herbs. 
This one yeah. seems like it actually can output some decent volume and things besides herbs. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the attractiveness of the modular aspect is the one shelf unit already has a pretty decent volume. But then if you had a big family or you, I don't know, wanted to sell stuff at the farmer's market or something, you could just add to it. Um, so I think I actually think that that's something we're going to see more of, too, is not just not just in-home systems, but in-home systems you can customize based on how much volume you want to grow. We've also seen a run on home or backyard chicken and hen house <laughs> as people mm -hmm. have been like wanting. Uh, I wonder if you can apply technology and have like chicken as a service. Is that something, Chris, you think we'll see soon? Oh, sure. I think what you're going to want to see more though is like the, uh, not to get too grim, but like slaughter as a service, right? Because there's going to come a time <laughs> when, when those chickens aren't <laughs> producing eggs and you're going to do something. And I can't imagine the yuppie who just wanted a chicken coop is going to get out there and, you know, take care of business. Mm. But you know, where I live in a pretty rural area. So we actually have like just down the road from me is a place that sells chickens and, and farm feed and stuff like that. So actually it's not uncommon around where I live uh, for people to have chickens. My have you thought of like, that's one thing, like I guarantee you the wife, my wife would not let me do like raise chickens. That's probably a never happen. Well, I mean, they're not indoors, right? Yeah. And then you get eggs. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have several friends who raise chickens. Uh, first of all, my dog would eat them. Like I have a dog that would, just, would love delicious chickens for breakfast. So it probably not going to happen, but we'll see. Well, I mean, there would an egg would go well with your cheese and mayo sandwich. That's true. By the way, let's go. <laughs> you're on team Tiff. I tweeted that I like cheese and egg sandwich. Do you, have you not eaten the cheese and egg sandwich? I feel like no, Catherine cheese probably- Cheese and mayo sandwich is what cheese, you were- oh, yeah, cheese, cheese and mayo, cheese, cheese and mayo. Cheese, cheese and mayo. egg is delicious. Um, cheese and mayo. Yeah, I was like, cheese and egg is pretty normal. Cheese and mayo, we're talking- What do you- Cheese like, and mayo is great. Yes, and mayo, it is. And it's a cold sandwich? Yes. Yeah, cold sandwich, cheese and mayo. And yeah. I actually prefer Miracle Whip, which is very controversial. Okay, I'm not with you there. <laughs> I can get on the cheese and mayo. What I do is when I make grilled cheese, I put mayo instead of butter on the outside. And it- grills much crisper because of the same thing. You put mayo on the outside? That's Instead a good idea, but it's not the same thing. It's, it's not the different. same. That's different. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of mayo and a big fan of cheese. So maybe that's what I make for lunch today and I'll, I'll get back to you. It's different, but intriguing. I want to oh, try yeah. it now. I want to try it now. Another big thing in the South, Jen, you may have had this, is the mayo and pickle sandwich. Oh, yeah. That seems very Southern. Do you fry yeah. it? No, it's cold, cold no, sandwich. cold. Do you wash it down with a pickleback? You can, optional. I mean, optional. you absolutely could, uh, you know, if you felt so inclined. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not inclined to any of this. I'm, just you know, I'm not on the cheese and mayo sandwich because that just seems like eating nothing. Well, you could wash it down with another Southern delicacy, random trivia tip for all our listeners out there with a little delicacy called red eye gravy, mm. which is where you take your leftover bacon grease, combine it with the morning's cold coffee mm. and dip your biscuits in it. Wow. That actually sounds Okay, uh, you guys are breaking up and <laughs> I'm gonna have to hop off. Uh, yeah. Don't I've got an unstable internet it, connection. <laughs> I mean, I grew up eating lots of like, like, Miracle Whip food, but also just like Velveeta and um, uh, what was that super squishy white bread that you can make in a ball? Oh, Wonder, Wonder. Wonder Bread with Velveeta yeah. and Miracle Whip. Like, can you get a more artificial sandwich mm -hmm. in, in those three ingredients? I would eat that as a kid. So yeah, I had a horrible diet, but delicious. <laughs> all right, before we gross Chris out too much, let's talk about something. Uh, I think, you know, all three of you have written about this company. I'm really intrigued by Integra Culture. Um, I, I may be... I, I think I may be right. Chris, did you break the original story of like mm -hmm. this idea of DIY shoki? Um, <laughs> I thought I did. And then I realized shiok meats or whatever. Shiok I meats, yeah. in there, and then I realized that somebody had written about them a long oh, time ago. Oh, shojin meat. Shojin, 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 shojin meat. Okay. Shiok meat is the, is the fish. Okay. Shojin meat. Shojin uh -huh. meat. I thought I did, but I didn't. Uh, I wrote, I was the first, I think, to write about them on the spoon. But okay. that was before I realized Catherine Ooh. was an expert in fake meat. So... This is a really cool company, Integra Culture. They raised $7.4 million. What I like about them is they're a DIY kind of concept. Uh, Jen, tell us about the news. And Catherine, maybe you kind of give it your perspective because you've written about them a little bit as well. Jen. Wait, what? Oh, I'm sorry. What? I, I was just kind of a messy handoff. 
<laughs> it's a it's a Friday. We're start. talking we're talking about Wonder Bread and Velveeta, and I can't handle what I'm doing. But oh. Jen, Jen, you wrote the story. I think about Integra Culture's raise is seven point four million. Yes, they. Sorry, edit that out. They did. They raised seven uh, seven point four million this week. Uh, and they said that a lot of the new funding is going to go towards uh, building a production facility. And they do something, Catherine, I know you've written a lot about this, uh, which is they do a cell-based foie gras. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Sounds right to me. Pretty Doesn't sure it's matter. foie gras. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Down here where I'm from, it's foie gras. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's an interesting product to start out with, I think, because that's obviously something, there's a lot of ethical issues surrounding, uh, now I want to call it foie gras, <laughs> surrounding foie gras. And uh, yeah, Catherine, maybe you talk a little bit about that because you've written about it in the past. Sure, yeah. So Integriculture, Japanese company that's working on cellular agriculture. Uh, they have two branches kind of. So Chris was writing about Shojin Meat, which is a DIY um, maker network for people that want to make cultured meat at home, sort of like futurists, tinkerers, makers. It's a pretty ambitious process, but you can make like a little bit of cultured meat at home with some not crazy hard to get materials. So there's a Slack channel for that in Japanese and English. And then out of that spun out a company called Integriculture, which is um, a cultured meat company that will sell both like media products, which you need to grow the meat, and also some cultured meat itself. And their first product is going to be foie gras, foie gras. <laughs> and the reason they started with that, I talked to the CEO when we were at SKS Japan, uh, last August is Yuki, because Yuki Hanyu. Yeah, Yuki Hanyu, mm -hmm. a wonderful and very like. He's a great uh, speaker. See, he's a lot of fun. Yeah, he had just come from like Comic Con that morning or something yeah. like that, and the instructions for how to grow your own meat are all written in a manga, like oh, Japanese brilliant. comics, and that's pretty cool. But anyway, they are doing it a because yes, lots of ethical uh, conflicts around foie gras. They banned it in some cities, including New York, and. Also, it's very expensive. So if it initially cultured meat is gonna be significantly pricier than traditional meat, but if you're starting with a product that's already expensive, like foie gras, it's easier to reach price parity. Uh, and also I think there's something about the fact that it's, it's all, so it's liver. And so you really only have to do one type of cell. Unlike if you're making like a steak, you have to make fat, you have to make muscle, you have to make all these different sort of tissues. Whereas if you're doing liver or something like that, it's a little bit simpler to just produce. Um, and yeah. Isn't, isn't one of their things that they, they would love to see people actually growing their own meat, like at home? Yes. Like that so DIY component? They definitely have that. Another uh, technology they just announced a few weeks ago is called a Colnet system, which is like cultivation. So that is basically a, a bigger DIY system that comes with some bioreactors and media and instructions for how to grow meat. It, I don't think that would be a casual or even pretty dedicated home person because I think it's going to be a pretty big operation and relatively mm. expensive. I think it's more for, say, if a restaurant wanted to grow its own meat internally or if a meat company wanted to diversify and add some cell-based meat, um, grocery stores, a, a bigger operations, farmers. Uh, it could be for an individual, but you'd have to be like pretty. So it's kind of like the, bell, the bellwether coffee of, of lab-grown meat, essentially. Of yeah. <laughs> yeah, taking it to the edge. So they're attacking it from a lot of different angles, which I think is cool. They've got the total DIY maker side. They've got the um, sort of like SaaS model with a system to grow your own cultured meat. And then they have their product, which I think they're going to launch by 2021, they said, the uh, culture foie gras. They haven't announced where, but could be Japan, could be the U.S., mm -hmm. Probably well, be Asia and, because of regulatory issues. They also have like space ambitions, right? Like I remember Yuki's, I mean, I think a lot of what drives it is Yuki because that guy is like we have noted awesome. Yeah. Um, but during his presentation, he's talking about like, oh yeah, you put this on Mars and then you can grow meat and like, oh yeah, that's going to be part of the roadmap. You're like, okay, of course. that's awesome. There's so yeah. much cool space food uh, stuff coming out of Japan. But yeah, he's super colorful. I love this company just because I love um, anything that has a DIY component. They're building a platform to, to build lab-grown meat at home. 
And man, how cool would it be to, if you're a small restaurant and like Eric Rivera wants to have his own meat that he grows in his restaurant, like I could see him using this. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. And you could tweak it. So you could be like, I want a steak, but I want it with this much fat and I want it with this much grass flavor. And I want it to taste like it was raised in this region. And then you can, you know, theoretically not ready yet, program all that in and then just grow your own meat. I mean, I mean tired, and, tired is like beer brewing at home. Wired is meat making at home. And so yeah. we're all going to be like getting like meat, meat making kits and for Christmas, maybe next Christmas, Catherine. Uh, well. <laughs> I, yeah, it's on my list to Santa. We'll see how it goes. Jen, I interrupted you. What was that? Oh, I was just going to say, I'm like thinking like big and far off in the future, but you could even imagine restaurants like having their own almost branded flavor of meat if they're growing it Ooh. in the restaurant, uh, yeah. which sounds really weird and probably will never happen, but it's still a cool concept. That is a cool yeah, concept. I can see that. Like Chipotle has its Chipotle steak and it's like got all the flavors <laughs> and the texture Chipotle that you want. <laughs> TM. Well, okay, I have to say, um, Catherine, your thoughts on uh, on this stuff, we always appreciate. And this brings us to the final chapter of today's call and why we want to do a video call. And uh, we're going to we're gonna have to say goodbye to you because you're leaving the spoon. Tell us what you're doing. It's true. It is uh, a long planned departure pre-COVID. I'm going to business school in the fall. So uh, please keep in touch, everybody. I will still be on the Slack. I'll still be around. You know, I'm, I'm a food tech devotee for life so you're not going to get rid of me and you know perhaps some guest posts on the spoon definitely some comments i'll be bugging these guys and i'm always around if you want to chat food technology either or or both so yeah i mean you're going to chicago right time. tell, tell oh, us yeah. a little bit about what you're going to be doing where are you going to school yes so i am going to northwestern's business school kellogg so just north of chicago and plan to keep focusing on food tech down the road uh one of the reasons i ended up going there is because they have a, a lot of like big CPG company connections. So mm -hmm. potentially working on um, innovation within a big corporation like a Nestle or a Tyson, working on the future of selling plant-based or cell-based meats, um, hoping to just make food more sustainable and leverage technology to make it better for us and for the planet. Well, I'm excited. Well, so we, I think we should all go around and Tell us, everyone say what their favorite Catherine memory is. Um, I, I think that um, I really had a good time both in Europe and, and running around with you guys in Japan, Catherine. You know, I remember speaking of cheese sandwiches or egg sandwiches, very simple sandwiches. We grew, grew an appreciation for the 7-Eleven egg sandwich in Japan. Um, Delicious. We also had a fun sushi dinner there. So that was probably my favorite uh, Catherine memory, among many. Uh, That's good. There's so many. Chris, do you have any favorite Catherine memories you, you want to share? Well, overall, I'm going to miss Catherine's a very good writer uh, and very fast. So that's always a pleasure to work with as an editor. Um, but sadly, the thing I'm going to remember most about Catherine is that she had a radio show called Louder Than Bombs and didn't know who Johnny Marr was. <laughs> I knew that was going to come up. Uh, it's like, look, I I, like, it, it's your last day. I got to say. It. Like, this, I have your leg is only nonstop here had, that's going on your that's going in your tombstone like, look had yeah. your had your radio show been like you know disintegration then i would have been like oh okay that's fine you know it's you <laughs> got it from a cure you got it from the cure but because you named it louder than bombs you know you, and you yeah i will never let I'd still, are you, are you gonna have a like, radio that's show worse than a, that's worse than a mayo and cheese sandwich what's your new radio show at northwestern gonna be called yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I'll have to make some sort of uh, food-related spinoff, like maybe some improper, uh, ill-informed Led Zeppelin references. <laughs> next. Yeah, Ooh. I'm just gonna dive deeper into the misinformation. Catherine, who are we gonna give a bad time about your your pop culture knowledge? Uh, I don't know. That's sad. You can Jen, still you look. She's still gonna be on Slack. Yeah, so yes. we, we can still, still like dish it out. It's not a problem. I'll be Jen, do you have any? Do you have any favorite Catherine memories? I mean, I have always had a really good time with you when we, the, ra the rare times we get to meet in person, which is in running around Seattle and New York. Um, what was the name of that pasta place we went to in Seattle where we waited outside for like an hour? Il Corvo and it closed. <gasps> Did it? Mm -hmm. oh. So it's great that we shared, that was my last time I ate there was with you. And it wow. was- Wow, okay. 
a beautiful meal we shared. Well, <clears throat> we'll save the victims of the restaurant industry collapse <laughs> yeah. for later. Yeah, that's um, another post. But yeah, that, that was a really fun day, just co-working and going out to eat at that place. Chris stole the Louder Than Bombs reference. I was absolutely going to bring that up. But um, <laughs> I think uh, one of the things I love about Catherine, too, is uh, she puts up with our warped sense of humor and constant teasing, <laughs> and she'll do it right back. So, you know, it's a, it's a rare talent, and we'll miss it. Yeah. You know, one of the things that sucks about this pandemic is like, we can't get together and like do a final dinner. Like, um, I mean, that would be great. You're going to have to just wait a year. Well, we'll, we'll meet in Chicago or you'll be back here and we'll take you out to dinner, Catherine. Uh, cause I definitely want to do that. Uh, I will say that like, um, it's hard, uh, as someone who, uh, is a manager and hires people like, you know, when you hire really smart people that eventually they're going to leave really good people, um, they're going to go eventually go. That's the problem with really smart and good people is they're going places and uh, Catherine's going places. So we're going to miss you, Catherine. Thanks, guys. So he's saying he's, he's, he's saying he's left with us dum-dums. Yes, <laughs> yeah. is what he's saying. All right, I, pity, I pity him. <laughs> Boy grass. Boy grass. Boy grass. Well, that's it. Um, on that note, um, thank you and goodbye, Catherine. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. Yes. Bye. Yay. Bye. Hey. Bye.